The second scripture reading for this morning continues where we had left off in the fifth chapter of 2 Kings. If you want to read along in the Pew Bibles, there are slightly different translations, bless you. And that can be found on page 329. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elijah's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. The Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and would wave his hands over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. According to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. Naaman urged him to accept, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except the Lord. May God's blessing uh, reside on the experiences of Scripture on this day. May it God, the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips. I like the prophets. I like the prophets a lot. I like the prophets because there's some part of me, just like the person who likes being scared, who likes to be troubled in soul sometimes. And the prophets can be troubled. I also like the prophets because in knowing the prophets and experiencing the prophets, I come to better understand Jesus the Christ. The message that he brought. The work that he did. So I like the prophets. And I get really excited when the the discipline of the lectionary that I use delivers me a bunch of prophets. That's why we're in this prophetic word period because the lectionary has given me a gift even if I have to wrestle with it. Nathan was given a gift, not Nathan, Naaman was given a gift as well. He might not have understood how much of a gift it was at the time, but he was given a gift. Naaman was important. He was well-to-do and very well-off. He was strapping. He was a soldier, a general. He was literally the one that the king would lean on. By all measures and accounts, theological and secular, folks looked at Naaman and said, he's got it going on. But he had something else going on, Naaman did. Something that was troubling in his soul. Yes, while he was well and while he was strong enough, he was leading raids for his kingdom into 
the land of Israel, where he captured people, including one young lady who became enslaved in his household. But he had something going on. There was something underneath all of this visual success. Naaman began feeling unwell. He began noticing that his body was not responding the way he wanted it to. Now for me, I would call that old age. I arrived a handful of years ago when I noticed that, gee, I don't bounce as well as I used to. I don't get up off the floor like I used to. <laughs> I said, you don't know anything yet. Yeah. <laughs> People keep telling me, it only gets better. <laughs> Naaman was diagnosed with leprosy. Leprosy covered a whole host of skin conditions in the ancient world. It's not just limited to what we call Hansen's disease today. And leprosy could be not just physically debilitating. It was socially and religiously debilitating. Because in many places in the ancient Eastern Mediterranean world, to have such a visual skin condition, visible skin condition as leprosy, however it may have been defined and encompassed, it meant that people had to keep away from you. In ancient Israel, the shadow of a leper was enough to make you religiously unclean. The shadow. Which is why they were often at the outskirts of the town, wrapped in rags, and had to proclaim to anyone coming by to keep away. Naaman could see the future. Whether or not his culture was as explicit in the way that it treated folks with leprosy or not, I don't know, but it's a very real possibility that he would become a social and religious outcast. He would lose all that he had. His position, his wealth, his health, even his family, his household. And so, we assume that he sought the best health care that could be had in Aram. There are doctors in Aram. There are rivers in Damascus. And judging by his remarks, he went and bathed in them. And yet, he still was suffering more and more from this disease, both physical and social. He was in danger of becoming quite separated. And so he receives a word in his desperation, and the word comes from a very important place in the life of Scripture. It comes from the person at the very outer edges of society, the one who would be at the lowest rung in the household, the foreign enslaved woman. She says if only he could go to Israel and see the prophet. The prophet. If only he would be allowed to go back into the land that he had raided and invaded and taken people from. If only he would be allowed to go back there and find a prophet in Samaria then perhaps, perhaps. Well, he gets permission to go. His king says, go on. Israel's not that tough. We've been beating up on them for years. So Naaman gets his entourage <coughs> and great wealth, incredible amounts of wealth, and he goes to the king, and the king says, <laughs> And this had to hurt the king to say, I'm not God. 
I can't heal this man. Aram is just picking a fight. If I can't make the king better, then they're just going to invade. If I can't do what Aram wants, then there's just going to be a war. If I don't bend to the will of this larger military force, then there will be blood. Elisha hears. And it's not that Elisha was actually there in the court. We can expect that there was a way of the word getting there. Probably a servant. Someone who was down near the lower rungs, <coughs> goes to Elisha, who had received the mantle of Elijah, the double portion. And Elisha says, send this Naaman to me. Let him come to me. Now, Naaman is a great guy. Secularly speaking, and he might be a really nice human being. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He's important. He has a letter from the king. He has wealth. He has an entourage with him. He has already traveled as far as it is from Damascus to get to where the king is at in Samaria. Now he has to go that much further? Damascus is a big city. Samaria... Not so much. He's already traveled so far, and yet here he has to go again. So he does. He gets all of his people together because he is a man who is looking to be healed and made whole, and he goes that much further, and what does he get? Not Elijah. He gets a messenger. Servant. Go wash in the Jordan. Now, I don't know about the Jordan in the ancient world, and I've never actually been there personally, but I've seen images of the Jordan today. I'm not certain about bathing in it. I grew up close to the Chesapeake Bay, and we would go down there, and I'm not so certain about bathing in the bay either. And we used to joke there at camp in North Carolina is that after a good rain, the creek that the camp was on was at least 14% pure. Naaman is an important person from an important place with lots of wealth and an entourage around him. He is greeted by a king who cannot do what is asked. He is greeted by a servant of the person who can do. And he's told to go down to a muddy riverbank and dip. I'm important. I don't even do this stuff. People should be taking care of me. The healthcare system should be handling me. I have the wealth and the means to get what I need in life. Why on earth am I having to do all of these things? Imagine the hurdles that Naaman was having to go through. And then pause for a minute and think about those who don't have the means that Naaman had. And then a servant comes along and says to Naaman, If Elisha had asked you to bathe a cat while walking on a bed of hot coals, surrounded by angry dogs, you would have done it. You would have scratched up, but you would have done it. He's just asking you to go down and dip. To immerse yourself. And boy, if I hear that word and as a disciple, I get excited. <laughs> go down and immerse yourself. And so Naaman, I imagine, begrudgingly says, oh, I'm going to go down and immerse this. And he comes up clean. Not just clean, but made whole. And that is by far more important than any physical healing or restoration. He is made whole by God. And so he goes rushing back, I imagine, to Elijah. And he comes and he says, 
let me pay you for your services. Now, I often struggle with words. Words are important to me, and, and they, they, they carry specific meanings. And Elisha points out that the gift that has been given to Naaman can't be bought. Can't. Truckloads of wealth, silver and gold and whatever else, this great entourage is sitting there in Elijah's house, all for the taking, and Elijah says, not for sale. What we have been given is not for sale. And if we could sell it, nobody could afford it. Which is why I struggle with the term business in connection to church. I understand it's a handy term, it covers a lot of ground, but I'm admitting I struggle. So Naaman says, give me some earth. Give me some dirt. Two mule loads. Give me something to take with me. Because in this ancient world understanding, the gods were, were geographically located. And so you would go to that land and you would worship that god in that land because that was the god of that land. When in Rome. So he wanted some earth to take back. All the way back to Aram, to Damascus, that he might worship God. Yahweh, the living God of Israel. He wanted some earth to take with him. And we engage in that same kind of behavior sometimes. We want to carry some physical, tangible thing with us to, to remind us of our connection with God. Sometimes we wear it as jewelry. Sometimes we have it in our wallet or in a pocket. Sometimes we consume it to understand this connection, the gift that we've been given to remind us, this physical reminder of God's presence. Naaman, who has been made whole, is going to go home again, but he wants to be reminded of this God experience. This journey he has taken, going into a hostile land and being actually welcomed, and then being restored, and then being sent home again. A gift that is given. Throughout this story, while there is this good news of healing and wholeness that the prophets does, because Elisha and Elijah were prophets that healed people, just like Jesus the Christ will be, there is also those troubling things that take place. The fact that this person, this kingdom, the leadership who are in positions of power and wealth and authority who have some understanding of what it is that is going on ultimately are not the ones who reveal the work of God. The enslaved servant. The one who ran to Elijah. The messenger that Elisha sent, the servants of Naaman, those are the ones for whom God chose to use. That's a horrible grammar. Those are the ones that God chose to use to reveal, to underpin the work of the prophet. And that should trouble us in this world that we live in. For there are those who have been pushed to the outskirts, who have been at times even silenced. And there are those who have been elevated because of wealth and power and prestige and whatever else we like about them. 
And if we only listened to the kings, and to the great leaders, to those who rend their clothes because they cannot do the things of God, then we will miss the words of the prophet. He tells us sometimes it's the simple things. For that message, thanks be to God. Amen.